main thing the main thing. Let me be very clear on this Russian thing. Let me go back to this Iran thing. I appreciated the you're hired, you're fired thing. This is the great Persecuted school thing journal. again. And let me, let me say this whole Putin thing. You whipped out that Mexican thing again. If it's not one thing, it's another. Mike Pence feeling pretty good today. Pence had a good debate last night, good reviews from all corners. 36 million people watch Pence v. Kane. It's the lowest rating for a vice presidential debate since 2000. 15 million fewer eyeballs than Paul Ryan and Joe Biden drew four years ago. As far as style goes, Pence is mild-mannered, much-prepared, disciplined defense of Donald Trump and Trump's policies and criticism of Hillary Clinton and her policies had much of the political world declaring that, at least when it comes to debating skills. Donald Trump may have been upstaged by his number two. It was a narrative that Pence was clearly trying to knock down this morning at a campaign stop in Harrisonburg, Virginia, where he demurred and called Trump the ultimate winner of last night's face-off. Trump himself, on the other hand, was in a credit-taking mood today in Nevada for putting Pence on the ticket. How many of you watched the vice presidential debate last night? Mike Pence did an incredible job, and I'm getting a lot of credit because that's really my first so-called choice. That was my first hire, as we would say in Las Vegas. And, and I'll tell you, he's a good one. He was phenomenal. He was cool. He was smart. He was, I mean, you just take a look at him. He was meant to be doing what he's doing, and we are very, very proud of Governor Mike Pence. Thank you, Mike Pence. John, speculation and some reporting last night that Donald Trump did not like the notion that he would be called not as good a debater as Mike Pence and that Pence was seen as kind of helping him out of the hole. How do you think Trump seems to be reacting personally to Pence's good reviews? Well, the thing is, I think there's, there's that. There's another element to this, which you mentioned the defense of Trump's policies. I think actually that's maybe been as much of a cause for Trump to be upset because Trump didn't really defend a lot of Trump's policies. Pence. Pence didn't really defend a lot of Trump's policies last night. That's one of the things I think that might have set Trump off. Look, he did not tweet in the middle of the night. Today, maybe he's like protesting too much a little bit, like kind of praising, over praising Pence in some ways. But at least as of now, on the basis of what we've seen and anything that I personally know on the basis of reporting, I think that that has been overblown, the notion that, that Trump has, has taken offense to the way Pence played it last night. He if, seems great. If it is the case that Donald Trump realizes that he needs to win the debate on Sunday, that his campaign is in a real tough place right now, I think one of the smartest things his staff has convinced him to do is to talk about this debate and win, as both he and Pence have suggested, as a win of ideas. Ideas, lower taxes, smaller government, smarter foreign policy. If Trump is, is focused on that in reaction to Pence, I think, I think he's doing just fine with this, and I agree. It seems to me, from what I've been told today, it's overblown. And Trump, Trump has not got the best poker face in the world. Seems pretty happy with where Pence left him. It's generally the case, as we know, that nominees do not like to be overshadowed by their understudies. However, we've seen the instances when you thought, for instance, in 2008, that John McCain might be upset about Sarah Palin overshadowing him right after the Republican convention. In fact, McCain was actually pretty happy. He looked at the big crowds and said, hey, this is actually helping me. I think Trump recognized he was on a bad run, that Pence gave him the best days, had an eight gave, days. Gave, he stopped the schneid that they were on, and he now knows that the pressure is all on him to perform. But I will say, I think the framing of it as a battle, of the won the battle of ideas, there were a lot of foreign policy issues, especially foreign policy issues, where Pence took except, effectively took exception to Trump. And the Clinton campaign put those out as a long list where right. Pence is in a different place than Trump is. So it's not like he's really adopted no, Trump's policy except, posture. But he has on lower taxes. He has on changing Washington. He has on critiquing Hillary Clinton. Right. Th this is uh, a good day, the best day they've had, I said, in a while. And the reality is Mike Pence wasn't in there talking about the Indiana miracle. He wasn't talking about no, that's much. true. He was did talking not talking about, about himself. He was talking he about not Donald talk Trump about and Hillary Clinton, and, and I think Donald Trump might feel a little odd about it, but largely feeling good. He's managed to whatever, whatever, whatever weirdness he feels, he's held it in check, yeah. and that's all that matters. Um, the second presidential debate is this Sunday in ye old gateway to the West, the home of the fallen Redbirds. Happily denied a playoff spot this year by the Giants and the Mets, who happen to be playing just a few miles from here tonight. Yay. That's right. We're talking about St. Louis. We have already seen Trump 
of course, practicing some new moves in the campaign trail in advance of that debate. There are also a few tips that he might be able to take from Mike Pence's performance last night. Unlike Trump in the first presidential debate, Pence often turned the moderator's questions into opportunities to attack Hillary Clinton. He also looked straight into the camera and spoke directly to the American people. Honestly, Senator, you can roll out the numbers and the, and the sunny side, but I got to tell you, people in Scranton, no different. People in Fort Wayne, Indiana, no different. I mean, this economy is struggling. You heard one of the last things he mentioned was border security. That's how Washington always plays it. I, I, can, uh, I can make it very clear to the American people. After traveling millions of miles as our Secretary of State, after being the architect of the foreign policy of this administration, uh, America is less safe today than it was uh, the day that Barack Obama became president of the United States. So, Mark, that's a, 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 a good debater's skill. It, it always is effective. Donald Trump didn't do it very much in the first debate. Mike, first debate, Mike Pence did it last night. What else? He could, Trump could clearly learn from that. What else can he learn from? Amazing that Tim Kaine failed. Totally, to do that. utterly, I mean, utterly. He was trying to fight with the moderator and fight with Mike Pence. And he didn't even know where the cameras American even people. were. He didn't even know which camera to Amazing talk to. Amazing to me. They obviously yeah. went over with him. I don't know how he didn't do it. You know, make America great again. The Democrats have pretty effectively tried to turn it into a negative slogan. Right. Why America's great now. Right. Donald Trump sees it as an optimistic thing. And one thing that Pence has always been good at, despite some quarters of the liberal media calling him dour, he has always been good at Reagan-esque optimism. Yeah. Look at this and think about if Trump talked more like this on Sunday. Yeah. When Donald Trump in the United States, we're going to have a stronger America. When you hear him say he wants to make America great again, when we do that, I truly do believe the American people are going to be standing taller. They're going to see that real change can happen after decades of just talking about it. And when that happens, the American people are going to stand tall, stand together, and we'll have the kind of unity that's been missing for way too long. That is the kind of message that Trump could absolutely adapt. I was surprised he didn't do more of it in the first debate. He got so caught up in negativity against Hillary Clinton. Well, he could adopt it. I mean, you know, part of the problem is that Trump, the basic, the, the Democrats are right about this. I mean, Trump's book, everything that he's, it basically says America is in a hellhole. It's, it's in the crapper, and well, I need to fix it. So it's not, his message is optimistic in the sense that he wants to improve the country, but his view of where America is now is, dark. Pretty, is pretty dark and pessimistic. That's been true through the Republican convention and all along. So it'll be hard for him to be as sunny about America as Mike Pence, but he's got to try a little bit. There's another thing that Pence did, I think, well, which is he's folksy and plain spoken. Donald Trump is not from Indiana. We're going to watch how Pence talks about this. But I do think that Trump could learn something from the colloquial way in which Pence talked. Let's take a look at that. I have to tell you, I'm a, I'm a small town boy from a place not too different from Farmville. Uh, I grew up with a cornfield in my backyard. My, my grandfather had immigrated to this country when he was about my son's age. My mom and dad uh, built a, everything that matters in a small town in southern Indiana. They built a family and a, and a good name. So there's, so there's a couple of things about that, one of which is, the, as I said, the colloquialism of it. And the other thing is the biographical nature of it. He's talking about himself in kind of human, relatable terms. Again, didn't see a lot of that from Donald Trump on the first debate. I mean, night. Trump, you know, he likes fast food and he was born in Queens, but he's never going to be at the same level of Pence of talking about being a, 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 a more ordinary person. Donald Trump's life for the last several decades has been anything but ordinary. ordinary. At the same time, I think, you know, he's yet to, in a compelling and, and heartfelt, uh, seemingly heartfelt way, talk about people he's met out on the campaign trail, a staple of running for president. And in the town hall, if Trump can't talk about, react to people asking him questions in a way that suggests he understands what their lives are like, he will be on the short end of that kind of exchange. Or talk about his family. You know, he loves his kids. You know, he loves his, his kids, his grandkids. He loves, you know, he's got a fa yeah, father. he loves his stuff. grandkids, but he said he couldn't talk about them for more than like a minute. But you know what I'm saying, right? I mean, there are things that he could, that Trump, I mean, again, both of these candidates, Hillary Clinton has had this problem too, he needs to be able to kind of talk about themselves in a, in a more human way yeah. that people can relate yeah. to. Pence, Pence was strong on that and, and, uh, and a model for uh, anybody in a debate like this. All right. So far, as we've talked about Mike Pence and his strong performance last night, we've talked about style. On substance, however, the governor of Indiana, who likes to borrow Ronald Reagan's line about facts being stubborn things, had a few truth-telling problems. Fact-checkers pounced on some of what Pence said last night, such as his claim that the Clinton Foundation spends less than one-tenth of its donations on charitable causes. The real number is reported to be more like 90 percent, and that the Clinton campaign is in favor of open borders. Media and fact-checkers also jumped on some of the instances in which Pence disputed 
Tim Kaine's characterizations of things that Donald Trump has said in the past. Some of those assertions were about positions Trump has shifted on. Others are really a lot about semantics. Kaine himself was also sometimes not having anything but a little bit of a trouble with the truth. He said Hillary Clinton, quote, quote, worked a tough negotiation with nations around the world to eliminate the Iranian nuclear program. Of course, John Kerry was the one who actually negotiated the deal, and the pact does not totally eliminate Iran's nuclear capabilities, at least not yet. Pence, though, stretched the truth on more occasions than his opponent by any count over the course of the evening. And yet, he was, by me and others, declared the winner of the night. So, John, is the media wrong to focus so much on style as opposed to talking about the substance and truth of what they said. I think there's there's a balance to be struck here. Anyone who doesn't think that style matters, that this is not a performance, um, is nuts because that is that is part of what this is about. It's why they spend so much time working and on it. And it's part of what being president or vice president is about. A hundred percent. So I think you it's perfectly appropriate for us to talk about who won on style point. The campaigns think about it too. Um, at the other on the other hand, I think that you know talking about what is accurate, what's not accurate. Uh, you know the, uh, the fact checking cottage industry sometimes seems. A little bit out of control and a little bit. They're absurd. in the business of fact checking, so but, everything to them is an opportunity to say, fly spec something and overstate the extent to which right. something was wrong or meaningfully wrong. But it is, but it is fair, and it also to be. I mean, look, it also takes longer. You know, like right after the debate, we have an impression of how people performed in terms of their their performance skills. It takes longer to go back, given you've had 90 minutes of material to go back and actually do the fact checking elements. In Pence's case, I do think you know this is sunk in the notion that he denied a lot of things that Trump has said or said something that close, and it's and it's getting out there, and the Clinton campaign is capitalizing on it. So no we should focus on it. We yeah. should focus on both. Yeah, and critics should be, as you just suggested, not so impatient. We takes a little bit of time to fact check and right. to think about right. not just what was technically wrong, but what's meaningful that it was wrong, right. and what impressions need to be corrected. Not fact checking for the sake of just sort of saying, "Ha ha, you got this fact wrong," right. but saying, "Here's what you need to know, voting public. Right. When they this candidate said X." you should realize that that wasn't true and here's why that matters. Pence clearly, in part because he was dealing with a lot of Trump complexity, yeah. said more things that weren't true and more things that were meaningfully true. But it wasn't some giant mismatch on that score. Right. Well, I, I think it was pretty. It was pretty out of out of proportion, just given the things that I said. Not giant. It, it was a mismatch. It was. It, there was a big. There was a pretty big mismatch. I think. Um, on another thing uh, that has been in the political bloodstream since the debate last night is that Mike Pence may have his eye on a White House bid in four years. In fact, that notion that that may have been animating a lot of what he did last night in terms of distancing himself from Donald Trump. Conservatives and liberals alike floated the theory that Pence is 2020 bound, but this morning it seemed to become a Democratic talking point. Pence decided that he was just going to play his own game. Mike Pence decided that this debate was going to be a audition for him for 2020. Mike Pence had his own agenda tonight, and to me it almost meant that he was auditioning for 2020. We didn't see vote for my guy. My guy's going to be great What we, from him. What we saw is vote for me in 2020. He's running in 2020. He, is. he threw Trump under the bus. This is about... Totally. T about, about Mike Pence running in the primaries in 2020. He <laughs> had a strategy to promote himself at the expense of Donald Trump. So, uh, Mark, the Trump, uh, sorry, the Pence 2020 theory, do you buy it? No. Mike Pence is trying to get Donald Trump and himself elected to the White House. Clearly, he realizes that his performance last night and his general role leaves him as strongly positioned as anybody to run in 2020 if Trump loses. But people who think he sort of made the choice in any given instant, I'm going to throw Trump under the bus. He went out of his way to do the best he could, as he has throughout this campaign, to defend Trump. The fact that it helped set him up for 2020, that is not his primary uh, sense of what he's doing. And I think anybody who thinks otherwise doesn't know Mike Pence and isn't paying attention to the choices he's making. Right. You can believe all the following things. I think these are all true. Mike Pence has thought about running for president. Mike Pence would like to run for president. If Donald Trump loses, Mike Pence quite likely will run for president. Also, it's true that Mike Pence did not defend Donald Trump in the aggressive way and, and line up right uh, sh shoulder to shoulder with Donald Trump in the way that Tim Kaine did with Hillary Clinton. There's a reason for that. They're not, they disagree about a lot of things, and Trump said a lot of things that are pretty hard to defend. But I think it's too much to say he had, as Paul Begala said up there, he had a strategy. He has a conspiracy where in his mind the whole time he was planning to throw Donald Trump under the bus. Didn't throw him under the bus, and I don't think he was mainly guided by that. But all those other things are true. And I think some of the times when he disagrees with him, he's doing it because he thinks it's helping the ticket. Yeah. Not, not because he's trying to... Bigger, broader Republican yeah. tent, right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, up next, 2016 goes back to the 90s, huh? We'll talk about Hillary Clinton's latest big-name surrogate out on the trail right after this.
Hillary Clinton's team is still cleaning up a bit of a mess after her husband criticized parts of the Affordable Care Act on Monday. Bill Clinton called Obamacare, quote, the craziest thing in the world, end quote. And now the Clinton campaign plans to roll out another figure from the Clinton era. That would be former Vice President Albert Gore, who will reportedly hit the campaign trail for the Democratic nominee in the coming weeks. He will talk about global warming, of course, as he often does. But he will also warn voters about the dangers of third-party spoilers, a topic that he knows a little bit about. The psychodrama between the Clintons and the Gores were a centerpiece of 90s politics. So, Mark, my question for you is, Hillary Clinton courting trouble by getting this particular band back together? Well, in terms of Bill Clinton, I think if that's the worst, most embarrassed, politically difficult thing he says, they're lucky. And maybe now, once again, we've seen this play many times before, they'll try to put in place a system to keep Bill Clinton <laughs> from causing these problems. Al Gore is not, I don't think, going to break through to young people. I bet a lot of millennials have never heard of him. They may not have heard of him, but not associate him with global warming. There are two messages the Clinton campaign needs to get out. Every vote counts, including and especially in Florida. And uh, one candidate cares about climate change, which matters to millennials. It, Gore may not do that directly, but there's a bank shot, which is Gore will get press coverage. Gore and Clinton out on the trail will get sure, coverage, sure. and that allows them to make the case in the media to on those two issues which are vitally important to her chances in Florida and elsewhere. Yeah, I don't see the I don't see the downside in doing this. This is an all hands on deck moment for Hillary Clinton. You know, she's ahead. She'd like to sew this thing up, get out to a point where she's got a, a, a somewhat safe lead. No reason not to bring Al Gore out, but let's be clear. An Inconvenient Truth now came out 10 years ago, which means that for a lot of millennial voters, they were like eight or nine years old when it came out. And although Gore is a big figure, obviously, in that movement and cares a lot about the question of climate change, he's not someone, I think, who's going to rally millennials in the way that a Bernie Sanders does, a figure of current uh, enthusiasm and passion for them. But again, I see no real risk in that. And again, Bill, you're right about Bill Clinton. You know, you, there's just going to be, this is collateral damage. You got Bill Clinton on your side. 90% of the time he's going to be great. And 10% of the time he's going to cause problems. There That's may be, there may be, stock. there may be Bill and Hillary psychodrama. There may be Hillary and Al psychodrama. There may be other psychodrama going on. Hillary Clinton and her team have done a very good job of keeping it hidden and below the surface. And so it's not affecting in public, at least, of course, the campaign. I like when you say there may be psychodrama between those people, by which you mean, oh, there's psychodrama, but they're keeping it under wraps. They're All right, wraps. coming up, strategists, strategists, and more strategists. We will have more strategists than we know what to do with. They will all be here on this set right after this.
Welcome back. Ooh. Uh, our next guest tonight is two guests tonight, and they're riled up, high fired up, ready to go here in studio. Trump campaign and senior advisor, Boris Epstein, and Democratic strategist Liz Smith, deputy <laughs> campaign manager in this cycle for Martin O'Malley's presidential effort I and the director that. of rapid response for President Obama's re-election campaign. It's spicy over there. Uh, <laughs> all right, you two, let's start with this question. If you were looking for a data point in the last 48 hours that would suggest to you that Donald Trump was ready to have a stronger second debate than the first debate, what would you point to? Liz, you first. Are you asking for a number or define a data point? No, just something that's happened that you'd say, oh, that, that makes fact, me think you maybe he's on to... You on know what? To maybe knowing how to do it. Maybe watching Mike Pence and learning from him. I don't think that's one of his D Donald Trump's strong suits. But look, Mike Pence. We were talking about this, and I'll compliment your guy. You know, he's always Thank had so he always That's had this so nice. reputation of being this blow dried, uh, you know, good presentation on TV type of guy, and it came through last night. And I think Donald Trump. Could learn from it, so I think that would be the thing I'd point. What to have you it. seen? Don't say that, even if that's your first choice. That's but what's not my something, first choice. What's something you've seen or heard that makes you think, oh, he gets it. He knows he needs to improve from debate. Well, first of all, listen. I think that we are continuing the trajectory we talked about last week, which we are leading in this race, and that we'll do, continue doing that going into St. Louis and then Las Vegas. So, the last couple of days, I think the swing out west has been great. I think the, the visit out west, starting in Virginia with the veterans, was great, and then going on from there. Great speeches, great crowds. He's energized. He's good. He's ready to go. And we were excited to talk about the issues, national security, the economy, and I think the town hall format is very much lends itself, lends itself to Donald Trump. He's authentic. She's robotic. He'll do great. Where are you, Boris, wait, where are you leading in the poll? Well, yeah, Boris, I was going to ask that question. Yeah. I know I, we got two new polls out today. The Monmouth poll in Ohio, which puts Clinton up by two over Trump. It's a state that he's been ahead pretty much the entire time. And the Ipsos Reuters poll that puts him up, puts her up by six points nationally. Every national poll and every battleground state poll for the last we're five up. or six days has showed her picking up steam we're and up pulling away from him. We're up in the LA Times. Yeah. We're up in the uh, UPI. Yeah. We're up in the Rasmussen. As far as that Monmouth poll, the last time they took that poll in August, we were down four. So that's a poll that's trended toward Hillary Clinton. So in the other polls in big Ohio, fan we're of up the UPI four. Poll we're up four. <laughs> I'm a big, I'm, I didn't even I'm know big, there listen, was a UPI I think the track poll. Of I didn't know there was still a UPI. The track <laughs> of polls, the track of polls overall measure intensity. Yeah. And I think they've been a very, a very good measure of where this election is. The polls that are coming out now nationally are all very much impacted by the media spin after the previous debate. So I'm not concerned. About or, or what some would say was Donald Trump's poor performance in the first debate. That would, I, another way, gonna, that would be another yeah, way of going. What I'm saying is media spin because I'm confident in that first performance, yeah. but I'm very excited for the one in St. Louis and Vegas. You call it a poor performance. I call it a reenactment re of the Hindenburg. Okay. Well, wow. That kind of More felt of a that, metaphor. That, <laughs> felt, that, that felt flat with me, but fair enough. I thought you were going to say that was as rehearsed and spontaneous as a Tim Kaine line from the debate. I'm not even, my lines are not not rehearsed like that, so I don't have prepared zingers. You know, I'm just here to talk about the issues. Yeah. Tim, how was Tim Kaine last night? How'd that go? What does everybody think? Well, what did everybody. you think about Tim Kaine? What did I think? Unhinged. Okay, so look. You said you said you thought Mike Pence did well. How did Tim okay, Kaine so do? There are two metrics by which you judge, um, you know, how people perform in debates: style and substance. On style, look, points go to Mike Pence. His his demeanor was good. He stayed calm throughout. Um, but in terms of substance, I think Tim Kaine got the better of it, and you know, <laughs> got the better. Of it. And we're seeing that today in the coverage. You know, last night all the coverage was okay. Mike Pence won, but today now people are focused on focusing in on how Mike Pence wouldn't defend Donald Trump's offensive comments that's about not, women. That's not he substance, not, that's style. So okay, he, no, let's no, talk no, about, no, no, Let's no. talk about substance. No, I'm, let's no, talk let's, about, let's let me talk finish, about Iran. Boris, Boris, let me finish. You have to name a topic no, then. Just, what's the topic okay. you like to like uh, defend better He wouldn't defend the Muslim that's, man. He would not what's the substance you like to He would not on. defend the deportation task, which Donald that's, Trump laid out just what, a On what topic do you think Cain was stronger than I, Pence. There's not one. Yes. On Iran, Pence I, was stronger. I'm nailing him down Iran, on issues. Iran was a, and he articulated on. Iran a Iran is a joke, right? Cain tried to go out there and say, oh, because of Hillary Clinton, Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons. We now know that in that agreement, there are loopholes which allow for Iran to keep uranium and enrich it. We also know that at the end of 10 years, they could do whatever they want. Now, we also know that $1.7 billion now have gone to Iran, somehow unrelated, but let's be honest, it was ransom. So Hillary Clinton failed on Iran. She failed on Russia, failed reset, failed on Syria, failed on Libya, failed on everything she's done as Secretary of State. So if there are topics but, you want to yes, talk about where Hillary Clinton this, is stronger, let's do let's it. Let's talk about Russia. She does we got Not less than 30 seconds to do this. Fetishize. Vladimir Putin. Fetishize? Yes. Bill Clinton received $500,000 for a 90-minute speech in right, Moscow. All right. And then got a personal phone stand call. By, stand by. We're going to come right. back with both Boris and Liz right after this. Continue the conversation. You'll never guess who's going to join 
Stay tuned for that. Back in a moment. We're back with Trump campaign senior advisor Boris Epstein Thank you, that's and so nice. Democratic strategist Liz Smythe. Here in our <laughs> Sorry, Smith. Um, and joining us from Washington, D.C., former RNC online communication director Liz Mayer. Liz, you are vociferously and sometimes saltily anti Trump. Um, but I want you to try. And anti Clinton, to and, be fair. Anti, I, I, hate, I hate everybody this cycle. Yeah, you're, you've come out, you're in favor of Gary <laughs> Johnson, right? So just, yes, just talk correct. last night from the standpoint of, of someone who doesn't like either one of the, uh, the tops of the tickets. How do you think the vice presidential debate played out? Uh, I think given that it was a debate that seemed to focus very heavily on the negatives of both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, I felt like a, a great deal of what was said, and it was actually tremendously accurate. I think, unfortunately, like most Americans, I came away from it feeling extraordinarily demoralized about the terrible choices that the two major parties have put forward this cycle, um, and, you know, really hoping that a lot of other people who are watching that will hopefully investigate their other options, consider writing themselves in or writing in somebody else that they like or skipping out voting on the presidential altogether and just going and focusing on down ballot. Um, but, you know, I thought that it was an interesting debate. I mean, for, for once this cycle, we actually saw a debate where people sort of acted the way you expect them to act in debates, uh, which was sort of gratifying and relieving and refreshing in a particular way. I didn't expect Tim Kaine to act like that in a debate coming in. Maybe a little too much Red Bull, who knows? But that was, I was really surprised. I did expect sort of a, a measured debate with some fireworks, but I was shocked by the way that Tim King carried himself. Well, I think, was, Boris, I think completely, if you, I well, think, I was, Liz, I'll well, let you talk, so I'll talk now. So it was, it was completely. Uh, Boris, you are, you're the king of interrupting really have, everybody. I mean, no, you should take no tips from Kellyanne Conway so, about not you know? interrupting Liz, all the women Liz, all the time. On, you are Liz, a bit like Ted, on. Tim Kane here. Come on. There's a lot of I was actually the one, I was the one talking. Here's what I was going to say before, um, before Liz decided to jump back in. You know, on style, I think you're, you're totally right. Governor Pence showed to be measured, showed himself to be somebody who's ready to step into the office of the vice president. But Tim Kaine came with those canned lines. He didn't have much beyond it. And then he didn't seem to enjoy himself. Yeah. Let me, that's what I thought I was wanna important. Switch to, I want to switch to Sunday that's, night. I don't totally disagree with that. Switch to Sunday yeah. night and start, you, start, start with Liz Smith here and then the other Liz. It seems to me Donald Trump needs not only a, a good debate performance, but a big audience. Do you get the sense? What's your sense of the trajectory the country's on Sunday night? Will the ratings be anything like they were for the first debate for the rematch or not? I don't think so. No. <laughs> drop off. I do think that will what, be a drop off. How many people do you think will watch? Uh, 80, see, watch, 80 plus 80, watch the first one. Look, look I'm not an expert in these things. I would say 
70, 65. 70, 65. Uh, Liz, what do you think? Is the country no engaged in the rematch? With re I have no particular views with regard to ratings or rematch. I just suspect that yet again we're going to see a debate between two people who have historically high unapproval ratings and that people are not going to be very enthused about voting for. But they do but, know where know, Aleppo is. Which is interesting, unlike Gary Johnson. Yeah, so, actually, Boris, like well, and, and unlike, I mean, and actually, I think, unlike Donald Trump does, but I think it's right. interesting to note that Mike Pence clearly does. And last night, he outlined a totally different policy with regard to Absolutely Syria to what Donald Trump exactly has, which is, which is totally excellent. Now, which, Boris, wait, Boris, wait, Boris, Boris, can, Boris, can, you, Liz, Boris, can you avoid interrupting people for like half a Liz, second? Because Liz, every me, time I see you on TV, this is Liz, all you let, do. Let me ask you, let me ask you, though, about your new candidate, Gary Johnson. In an interview with Andrew Mitchell yesterday, he basically proudly said, I don't know any world leaders because they're all horrible career politicians. I, that's why I don't like any of them or know any of them. Is that a position you're comfortable with for the next president of the United States? It's not the optimal position, I will grant you that. <laughs> uh, but compared to Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump on foreign policy, I'll take it. Okay. At least this isn't a guy who was totally naive enough to buy into the idea of a reset, reset with Russia and Vladimir Putin, and who now, for Trump's part, is buying into the idea that he can somehow do the same thing that Hillary Clinton tried and failed at a couple years ago. I mean, he at least at least Gary Johnson is somebody who I think understands that Russia is instinctively disinclined to be our friend, no matter how much we kiss their butts, which is something that Donald Trump keeps trying to do and keeps thinking that he's going to make pals with Vladimir Putin if he Absolutely keeps doing not. it. You and something be more that, wrong, Liz. Well, that's actually completely okay. inaccurate, yeah. Boris. Yeah, Boris, I, Boris, I know that you spend a lot of time on TV, so it's hard to keep up on the news and what your candidate actually says, but okay. the reality is that your candidate spends more time kissing Vladimir Putin's butt than just about anything you else just these days. The word butt, which is Maybe that's not why you're on a campaign this cycle. Moving on. Um, that's an interesting characterization. All right, uh, no, I've been on campaigns this cycle. In fact, I ran the super PAC that did the most damage to your candidate, which is and, why and you're pissed off at me. 14 million people voted for us in the primaries. Let me just is. ask you this question. Just on, okay. on, on this question, on just on a, on a factual matter, sure. right? I, I, over the course of the last 24 hours, I've read countless conservatives, countless foreign policy conservatives who've gone and basically agreed with the Clinton campaign and made long lists of places where Mike Pence's foreign policy is at odds with Donald Trump's foreign policy. Mm -hmm. It's not a Democratic talking point. It's not a liberal talking Point. You hear it from no, it's just a fact. Neo Conj, you hear it from other people. So, are you actually trying to make the claim that Donald Trump and, and Mike Pence are in sync in terms of foreign policy on Russia, Syria, all the places where they let's, were able, they laid out about, totally different visions? Let's talk about each one. On Russia. Start with Syria. Start with Syria, yeah. sure. On Syria, Donald Trump and Mike Pence have been very specific that we need safe zones in Syria for the refugees to be in Syria. Now, as far as dealing with the crisis of Syria, both Donald Trump and Mike Pence have been specific and in sync that we need to work with our allies and we need to leave all course, options on the table, but course, we don't want boots course, on the ground. Of course, Donald yeah. Trump, Donald Trump, quote, let Syria and ISIS fight. Why do we care? Let ISIS and Syria fight and let Russia, they're in Syria What's already, let from? them fight ISIS. What's that quote? When, when's that quote from? I don't have a date on the right, quote, that but that is, a, that is a he quote. Says like that. He, he says things now, like not, that. Wait, wait, hold on, Liz, weekly. hold on, Liz, hold on, Liz, hold on, Liz. Are you saying it's just not operative anymore? That You're not quote, denying that he said those that, things. That quote is from, taken out of context probably a year and a half ago. <laughs> the foreign policy of this campaign has been very consistent, and that's what I just laid out. Now, on Russia, let's be honest with you. On Russia, both Donald Trump, Donald Trump and Mike Pence. You got to stop because we're running. Sure. Ending Liz, and then we're done. Okay. Talking about ISIS, like, again, on ISIS, what, in one of the debates, his policy that he laid out was that he was going to bomb the out of ISIS, and that was his big plan to deal with it. So now it's How great. did Hillary do with ISIS? How, she, How she did is, do with ISIS? She is 80 dealing with ISIS. 80% of people killed by ISIS right. have been killed in the last three years. We, gotta get, we, gotta we get can this, thank this Hillary Clinton for ISIS. This could go, this could go yes. on for a long time, but we got to go. But I like having the three musketeers here. So <laughs> Which one am I? <laughs> and there's just so much love in this room. Yeah. Everybody like is just loving each other so much. It's a big, huge love fest. Boris Epstein. Well, I'm, in, I'm in D.C., so I don't need to be part of you're, the, you're the base, love fest. I don't do the loving. I do the hating. Okay, well, that's a perfect self-characterization. At least you said it, not us. Boris Epstein, Liz Mayer, it was great to have you. Liz Smith, great to have you too. Thank you all, Republican strategist Mike Murphy, joining us after this. And if you're watching us, if you're watching us in Washington D.C. and seeing this incredible fireworks, you can also listen to it on the radio. Radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We'll be right back.
Welcome back with us now, Mike Murphy, veteran Republican strategist of many, many campaigns, despite his youthful look, huh. a staunchly never Trumper, and the former chief of Right to Rise, the super PAC that tried to get Jeb Bush the Republican nomination. Today, Fell a little short on that front. Today, we're going to tap into Mike Murphy's sense of how to run a campaign and talk to his big brain about what the two presidentials can do, should do in the remaining weeks. So let's talk with uh, Trump. Uh, My sense is that their internal data is not too far from the public data. Down five nationally, nowhere near the 46, 47 minimum they right. need to win. So they put on some new ads. They've got two debates coming up. What are their options to go to the boss and say, boss, we're behind. We need to change the dynamic or we'll lose. Right. They're in October now. And the good news is the earned media attention has never been hotter. So the bad news is they're in October and the clock is ticking and it's bad. So what they've got to do is the ads are interesting, the polling's interesting, but they got to get Trump to start running a campaign that brings new voters in. He's stuck in that cul-de-sac where he's losing college educated white people by way too much and he's losing minorities. That's a that's a chokehold. And the way to break that is to see a new, more creative Trump hammering on his wrong track, change everything, no more politicians, I'll put you to work without tripping over his own shoelaces. And that's the that could be the bridge we too far. I'll say there's nobody like Trump. Have you ever had a client where you had to go to him and say or her and say, you've performed at best inconsistently. I need you to now focus on the home stretch, and they've actually done it? Well, yeah, but I've only worked for people who don't have Trumpian disconnect from the campaign. See, I don't really bother the theory there's a campaign so much as Trump is doing his thing and there's some staff kind of scurrying around trying to kind of nudge him in the right direction. Unless Trump decides to change up some things, he will not use the earned media hammer to move numbers, which means he'll be down to ads. And in the ad war, they're being outspent still pretty substantially. It's not enough. He's got to get the earned media moving a narrative that helps him. And, you know, we haven't seen it yet, but there's... 30-ish, you know, days. Is there? I mean, uh, is there really any... Ch I mean, I, look, the, the world is different now, right? I mean, different than it has been. And there's not that many days left, right? So if Trump right. started behaving like a perfectly disciplined, disciplined candidate and doing exactly what you would want, is it... There's, is there still time to move those numbers? Or is the overhang from everything else that's happened for the past months just too great? Well, I think it's heavy baggage, but the only shot they have is to try to change it up and put Trump on a script that resonates to more people than his primary voter base. That's all they got. There's headwinds, but if they don't do that, it's going to fold in on them, and it's going to be a three- to five-point race for Hillary all the way in. And if you looked around at the, at the map right now, again, given what the current polling is, where would you be? How, what was the path that you would try to run? You know, caveat would be... I try to fix the big stuff because that'll fix the little things. I mean, if you aren't working right nationally, you're not going to fix Ohio, or at least in the polling, he's closest. Um, but, you know, he's got to draw to some of those states. I think Colorado's out of reach for him. Virginia's going to be really hard with Kane. So it's got to be Ohio, Florida, and North Carolina as the real push. But if he does the national stuff right, all those things will get better. And then maybe he pulls an Iowa or something out of the, you know, the draw to the inside straight. Generally, the fewer minority voters in a state the better chance he's got. So within the Clinton campaign, again, my sense is they're going to her pretty much every day or frequently and saying, so you're up five nationally, the battleground states look good, Trump has no path. She then turns to the senior staff, including you in this exercise, and says, <laughs> fantasy guys, scenario. Like, like, I don't want to, I don't want to sit pat. Like, what can we do to be more aggressive or do we need to be? I think because Trump has now proven that the logo of his campaign should be Trump's face with a fish hook in it. He takes bait like nobody I've ever seen. I'd put a couple of insult comics on the road and just provoke him every day for the rest of the campaign. Get Sarah Silverman a plane and a bus and just poke at him. Let him pick surrogate fights to keep the Trump crazy up. Well, then I would start sending dog whistles to Republicans. You know that Tim Kaine's kind of a fiscal conservative, a moderate to help them have somewhere to land. There's another point or two for her if she does that right. If she doubles down on the Elizabeth Warren stuff, which one half of her campaign will say, base, 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 uh, she could scare away some of those voters that she can get away from Trump. Remember, these college-educated white voters that are normally Republican who don't like Trump need a little reassurance to land with her. There's a reason Mitt carried them by double digits. They're not that comfortable with liberal Democrats. She has to be careful about the dog whistle. So surrogates and landing pad for more fiscally conservative voters. In the same way the Trump campaign is worried about the voters you're talking about, the Clinton campaign is worried about millennial voters. It's like the one place where they look and say, wow, like we are really underperforming with a group that Barack Obama performed extraordinarily well with. Should they be as worried about that as they are? No. I think when in doubt, 
September is about misleading polling data. October is about the normal gravity of elections coming in. The Democrats start doing Democratic things, Republicans do Republican things. They will get, I think, their share. Maybe not Obama's share, but they will get plenty of millennials. The question is more her message that she closes on, will it be a bit welcoming or will she double down on the base stuff and alienate voters who we know vote, which are those independents who are more fiscally conservative. At the end of a campaign, the losing, the side that's behind, in my experience, the candidates start to say with increasing frequency, where's the Reverend Wright tape? Yeah. Where's where's the you know the secret uh, ledger from Trump right. headquarters? The wonder like, weapon. It's yeah. going to change everything. So should should Trump senior staff be egging him on on that and say, well, who knows what Julian Assange is going to do today? They should say, Mr. Trump, that'll take care of itself. Yeah. You, the worst thing to do in October is obsess on things you don't control. The Trump campaign, in a perfect world, which I don't think we have, should be having at least some influence on Trump. If they could fix that, that's 90% of their trouble. I, I think it's a lift too far, knowing what Trump has been like. But yeah, don't waste time on fantasy stuff for crazy. Try to get Trump to act like a change candidate without risk. And that's the trap he keeps walking in. But including keeping it out of his head. Right? Yes, totally. There's an old joke in my business, which is never tell the candidate a joke on debate day you don't want to hear. You know, whatever you do, don't tell this joke. Two alligators, a rabbi, yeah. and next thing you know, eight minutes in the debate, <laughs> hey, they, they go for the joke. Right. So less clutter in Trump's head. It's crazy enough by itself. More focus on change. I'll deliver the economy, and I'm not a boogie monster. Right. Last question uh, yeah. on the Clinton side, right? We all know Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, great surrogates. Joe Biden, great surrogate. Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, in some ways, important surrogates. Two new surrogates, one old, one new. Bill Clinton, Al Gore. What do you do about Bill Clinton and his propensity for saying stuff that's problematic, and yeah. should she be employing Al Gore or not? I would park Bill Clinton in those metal bending states because he's the best guy in the Democratic Party at connecting to people who feel a little left behind, you know, basically blue collar white guys. He's the best weapon they have. With Gore, they're selling it that Gore is a ticket to millennials because they have this problem they're worried about. I would say one thing millennials are not that interested in is yesterday. So I, I, Gore should be raising money. I, I don't think he's a voter mover. Mm -hmm. They, they think he draws press attention. I think that's why they're... Maybe, but then what kind of press attention do you... Yeah, they ought to have insult surrogates to tangle up Trump, and then they ought to be sending dog whistles to voters who normally would be a Republican that it's okay to land on Hillary. You're not going to get a Karl Marx uh, uh, loving administration. Mr. Mike Murphy, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. It's always good to see you. Coming up, more on Donald Trump's trip to the Silver State today, right after this.
She is such an NBC road warrior that sometimes you think she's in like a Mad Max movie. And today, the road that she rides has led her here to our studio in New York. Joining us now is MSNBC political correspondent Casey Hunt. Casey, um, we have been talking all day about the debate last night and the debate on come to come on Sunday. Let's talk about last night. The Clinton campaign like basically says, you know, we won this debate. Do they believe they won this debate on their terms? I don't know that they believe that they won it, but I'm pretty sure they think it probably doesn't matter that much in the long run. I think this is, you know, they're defending. They did want Tim Kaine to go out there and defend her, and they do feel like he did that legitimately. I'm not sure they really think the style always worked, but they got through it. There was no major gaffe problem. All is fine. We talked last night here amongst ourselves. I would love you to weigh in on this. Are they as confident that they're going to win as the Obama campaign was four years ago? Do they look at the data that they get every day and say, the numbers are just not there for Trump to beat us? Honestly, my sense is that they are not quite as confident as Obama in 12, but they are not unconfident that she is in, in the place where she needs to be. I mean, they feel like the fundamentals are exactly where they need to be. I think they needed to settle out around 5% nationally, I would say, for her to be in a strong place. But I mean, the reality is things seem to be outwardly going really well. She's still struggling in Ohio. They're still on the air in Pennsylvania. They have some issues. They're not you know, sending people in doing presentations. I remember Joel Benenson doing this in 2012, where he was able to essentially say, here are all the people that have already voted for us that the Romney people claim are going to vote Republican. It's just not the case. And right now, I don't hear the Clinton people making that kind of an aggressive argument. Yeah. Do you think that, as you know, we, we talk a lot about whether Trump gives this is such a must win debate on Sunday night for Trump. Everyone agrees Trump must win or he's made it pretty much doomed. Um, do they feel. <laughs> he's been pretty much doomed many times. However. Well, yes, but I mean, but I think there's the consensus, Republican, Democrat alike. Do, do they feel happy about going into St. Louis, not just with the wind at their back politically, but also into that format? Look, I think hall. it's a tricky format, right? Especially we've never seen a female candidate uh, in this kind of a format. I think, you know, she has gotten a lot of practice in this format throughout this campaign intentionally. This is what they did early on when they put her in these small group formats in Iowa. Just yesterday, she was doing a town hall event with Chelsea Clinton. Publicly, they're arguing this format helps her. He's not as used to it. It hurts him. I am interested to see what Trump is like in a physically small space. That is one thing that we never see him in those kinds of settings. He's always on stage behind a podium, pretty far away from the people that he's interacting with. So I think, you know, they have to grapple with the semiotics of it as much as they have to grapple with the, you know, the policy questions and, and dealing with voters. She's still fundraising, uh, probably for a couple more weeks. Do we expect more policy speeches from her, or, or just now we now in the phase she'll do a little more fundraising, the debates and rallies? It seems like this phase is debate prep plus raising money. That the next couple of weeks, that's what we're going to see. And those are from compatible that. activities. Exactly. So, you know, I mean, she's going to, she's planning a West Coast swing, we know. So I'm interested to see how they're going to balance those two things. But essentially, yes, fundraise in the evenings, prep for the debates during the day. And then they'll get to the kind of final stretch of campaigning, I think, not till the final weeks. I mean, it has in many ways felt like we keep waiting for her to ramp up, waiting for her to ramp up. And it sort of, never quite happens, it seems like we're only going to get really three weeks of it. It seems to me like one of the things, to go back to the debate in the town hall format, one of the yeah. things that's really an, a, a wild card variable is the gender dynamics of the two of them, not just in a small space, but able to walk out from the podium and get in each other's physical space. We've yeah. seen that happen in past presidential debates, but never between a man and a woman. Donald Trump's a big guy. How did this Clinton campaign yeah. planning for that, thinking about how that might play out? Well, they've been a little bit... Uh, tight-lipped about exactly how they're mocking up these debates. I mean, we know that for the last one, they did it exactly as they, you know, perceived that it would be set up. I talked to John Podesta last night in the spin room. He alluded to them doing similar things, but I do know that this is something that they are thinking a lot about. And I was actually, I was watching her at her town hall event, and she stayed seated, did not, you know, she has had this habit, if you remember from the primaries, of when she takes a question, she'll stand up and walk around the stage, you know, talk to the voter. That was kind of her habit. Right. This event that she held yesterday, oh God, this is, the days are so long, I can't, I can't remember which day this was, but it was yesterday, she stayed seated. I, I wondered if that was practice for this upcoming debate. Is she, these days, seem to be performing well? I would say so. I was with her on the campaign trail on Monday, and she kind of, we did more events than, you know, than typically we have in, in a campaign day. She didn't make any mistakes. She seemed to, you know, present strongly. I think they feel good about it. Okay. Casey Hunt, thank you. When we come back, Donald Trump walks into a first grade classroom, and you won't believe what happens next.
<laughs> that was Donald J. Trump billionaire this afternoon visiting a class A first graders at the International Christian Academy in Vegas. You can visit our website right now, BloombergPolitics.com, for more analysis of last night's debate and maybe of that visit, which is incredible. Bloomberg West is up next. We'll be back here tomorrow. I want to go to a Christian Academy in <laughs> Vegas. I want to go. I mean, Don't you want to go to a Christian you know, as, Academy as, in Vegas? As, that, when I go to Vegas, the first thing I do is go right so to the many, Christian Academy. There's so many things that Donald Trump has not done that normal candidates do very often. I mean, in schools and diners and factory tours, he's done them well, a handful. But and there was a time he told the baby to leave, too. You know, and that, Thanks for watching. We'll be back here same bad time, same bad channel tomorrow. Until then, sayonara. I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of your first word news. Hurricane Matthew is taking aim at the U.S. East Coast. At least half a million people in Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas have been ordered to evacuate. The storm's track has it headed near Florida's Atlantic Coast Thursday evening. The storm killed at least 11 people in the Caribbean. President Obama is praising the Paris Climate Change Accord, which was ratified by European Union lawmakers today. The agreement commits rich and poor countries to take action to curb the rise in global temperatures. And if we follow through on the commitments that this Paris Agreement embodies, history may well judge it as a turning point for our planet. The accord takes effect in a month. Russia has suspended an agreement with the U.S. on research cooperation in nuclear and energy sectors. Moscow calls the move a countermeasure to U.S. sanctions imposed over Russia's role in the Ukraine conflict. On Monday, Moscow canceled an agreement with Washington on the disposal of weapons-grade plutonium. The Syrian government reportedly will reduce the number of airstrikes and artillery shelling inside Aleppo. The move could allow civilians to escape to safer zones. In the meantime, the United Nations released satellite images from rebel-held parts of Aleppo showing damage believed to have been caused by airstrikes. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. Bloomberg Technology is next. Technology. Tech is global, and so are we. We are pushing beyond Silicon Valley to bring you the stories around the world that matter most, from San Francisco to Shenzhen, Tel Aviv, London, and Berlin. And with that, we are excited to welcome you to Bloomberg Technology and say farewell to Bloomberg West. It's been a great run. 
Coming up, it has been one year since Jack Dorsey returned to the helm at Twitter. We'll take stock as the company's future hangs in the balance. Plus, he's one of Uber's biggest shareholders. Chris Saka tells us what he thinks of the ride hailer's prospects in an IPO. And a smoking Samsung smartphone causes Southwest Airlines to evacuate a plane. We'll dig into the details, including one report that the faulty handset may have been a brand new replacement. But first, to our lead, it is one year since Jack Dorsey came back to Twitter as CEO, and it's been a rough one. Twitter shares are nearly 12% below where they were a year ago, as investors fear Jack Dorsey may not deliver on the turnaround he needs. Meantime, talk of a sale officially on the table, with bids potentially rolling in within the next couple of weeks. Salesforce, Disney, and Google have all been cited as interested buyers, but a disagreement may be brewing between Jack Dorsey and the rest of the board as to what is best for the company. We're uh, 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 in, a, in a strong position right now, I think, and um, you know, as a board member, we, we have to consider the, the right options. We've always had a lot of, uh, a lot of speculation around what Twitter could become and, and what Twitter, where Twitter could, would go. Um, but we have a really strong plan uh, ahead of us and something that we're, we're focused on executing. I think Twitter can be uh, a successful independent uh, a company. And I've also said that I think the world of the team over there, I think Jack thinks beautifully and elegantly and clearly about product direction and, you know, Anthony and Adam and Vidya and the rest of the senior leadership team over there are tremendous. So I don't think that's the only possible outcome. And, uh, you know, um, I think there are lots of different ways that Twitter can be successful. I hope for an acquisition, I think there are some great product teams that this fits in with naturally. And that's not a new thing for me. I've been saying this for a long time. I think it is a natural complement to at least four or five companies. The many faces and voices of Twitter there for many former CEOs, co-founders, Chris Saka, of course, longtime Twitter investor. Joining me now to discuss our Bloomberg Tech reporter, Sarah Fryer, who covers Twitter, uh, Monas Crespi and Hart analyst, James Chakmak, and my guest host for the hour, David Kirkpatrick, CEO of Techonomy. Sarah, I'll start with you. You've got some new reporting out that Jack Dorsey may be losing control of the company, that there are dissenting voices within the company about what to do to, t to sell not to sell and about strategy in general. Explain. Certainly, as you mentioned, there's disagreement between co-founders Jack Dorsey and Ev Williams about whether a sale is the best thing for Twitter. Jack wishes he had more time to prove out the live video strategy that Twitter's been trying. Now, that strategy, uh, you talked about internal conflicts. Um, I wouldn't call it a conflict so much as a seed of power to Anthony Noto, the CTO of Twitter, who has been able to sort of put the company on this live streaming path Path. He's he made the NFL deal. He's made a lot of these other streaming deals, and that's really caused the the product strategy to follow. And Jack is is just letting him kind of set the set the road. You've heard from a number of sources that that Noto is, has become really the cheerleader within the company, moral support, but also leading the live strategy there. James, you know, we're expecting bids uh, to roll in over the next couple of weeks. Disney, you believe, is the best bet. Why? Sure. I, th I think what Disney needs to do is figure out, you know, how am I going to be distributing my content when people are no longer subscribing to cable bundles? And what Twitter does is provide a platform uh, to distribute that content while also enabling a system where we do think that Twitter could remain at an arm's length and repain, remain independent to do deals with other competing content providers. This news today on Salesforce, I'm still scratching my head on uh, because why, why would Salesforce want to buy this? Yes, I get the argument argument about the marketing cloud, fine, about leveraging their customer service relationship and management software, fine. But at the end of the day, uh, I think that this is more about Mark Benioff's ambition to get to $10 billion. Um, I get the fact that this is a, uh, a data, ad, and this is the way I would think about Twitter. I, I, you are acquiring data and distribution, and that's why I just don't think that the news today on the Salesforce really jibes. We think that Disney makes the most sense. Uh, I understand you also think that Google uh, is a less likely candidate, potentially because of antitrust issues. However, in speaking with Chris Saka, uh, the investor, yesterday, he seemed to think that Google was one of the best fits. Oh, academically speaking, on paper, 
you know, we the, we think that Google uh, makes an ex excellent choice, you know, because they're already working together and, um, you know, in leveraging the tweets and putting them into the search results. But ultimately, you have to think about Google's position not only here but also abroad, and they're facing considerable amount of antitrust uh, litigation and the, and the issues uh, in the EU, and you could see that uh, surface here in the U.S. as well. And if you bring in on 300 million active social kind of uh, members onto the uh, uh, you know, Google platform and how it looks against the Facebook per se, you know, we think that that could potentially raise some issues where it makes another acquire like a Disney uh, more feasible. Chris Saka, by the way, who's been a longtime shareholder, he did tell me yesterday he has sold a, a number of his shares, though he still owns a lot of Twitter shares. He's also been a huge cheerleader for the company uh, and, and, and also had this to say. Take a listen. It's just an incredible story of underachievement, of potential that was never realized. And so I'd be really excited for someone with some product vision to go in there and take some chances. We know that it's got the most valuable corpus of data, the most valuable body of information in the world. There's stuff in there for every person on this planet that's interesting. They have just failed repeatedly to surface that in an easy to digest way. David, weigh in on this. Well, you know, I think it's funny to call them an underachiever because, you know, they really do punch way above their weight in terms of their social presence, their influence in the global dialogue. I think just their general visibility among tech companies. They're way smaller than all the tech companies they're always refer, always a, a, a compared to, both in, in revenue, market cap, etc. Um, and yet they really are seen as on a par with Facebook and, and you know, it's really weird. I also think it's very interesting to look at the fact that you've got companies as diverse as Google, Salesforce, and Disney all having legitimate reasons why they might want to buy it. it